Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hey friends, Jason here. In this episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Rob Rivera, president of Energy Pipe and Supply based out of the New Orleans area. I've worked with Rob over the years and, uh, you know, really enjoyed uh, spending some time with he and his company and seeing the evolution of this organization. And he and I, in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, business succession and, and moving towards training up the folks that really are ultimately going to push us out of the business. And, uh, you know, it was just a great discussion talking about not only that, but, you know, really how did Rob get here and, you know, joining the family business, which is a common theme in this show. But, you know, really, what can I do to make my mark on the business? And then ultimately, what it's like to then surround yourself with other distributors and share ideas. So obviously, a great conversation with Rob. Uh, it's just always a pleasure to catch up with him. So I really enjoyed that conversation, and I hope you do too. This episode of Distribution Talk is sponsored by InSQL Distribution Software. InSQL is a fully functional distribution-based software package. I say distribution-based because that's important. Many alternatives out there say they do distribution, but they really aren't very good at it. They're generally watered down manufacturing packages with a few distribution features tacked on. I only recommend software packages that were purpose built to serve distribution. And these folks do it very well at a price point many smaller distributors can afford. If you're ready to step up to a fully loaded, scalable distribution package at an affordable price, look no further than InSQL Distribution Software at www.insql.com. That's I-N-X. SQL.com. Well, hey, Rob, uh, welcome to Distribution Talk, man. It's always good to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad to catch up. So, you know, one of the things I like to do in the show, and I know a little bit about your story, but obviously the audience doesn't, but, uh, you know, I want to know, you know, how did you get into distribution? You know, why did you choose this profession and frankly, why you're still doing it. So take it away and you know, tell me, uh, how'd you get in? Well, I, I am second generation, but I'm not mm -hmm. like a lot of second generation where they grew up in it and they were, you know, out in the warehouse as kids and such. For me, I was already in college studying yeah. business and, um, you know, halfway through undergrad and my father started the company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was never a thought of me joining the business, but, you know, I was in college and broke and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I picked up odd jobs, worked the summers and Christmas breaks and, you know, driving old rundown trucks and uh, working warehouse. And so I did that for a little bit. And over time, you kind of look it around and, you know, next time I'm doing some clerical work, I'm, you know, I'm in the Cardex. And most people, a lot of people around don't recall all the Cardex, but I was there recording in the Cardex. And, yeah, uh, yeah hunting and pecking on a typewriter, typing out invoices on, you know, the four part carbon invoices and such. Yeah. And oh my God. Yeah. So I was doing these things and kind of looking around thinking, this is crazy, you know, because I was already using computers and such, but it was manual to start with and it was old school. And um, so over time I was kind of trying to introduce computers and, you know, some databases some history of some products and sales. And so that's kind of where it went. And, yeah. you know, I continued through grad school, really still not thinking this is where I'm heading. But, um, you know, I got out. My dad asked me to come on board, accepted a job making less than all my friends were making coming out of grad <laughs> school. Of course, of course. But jumped in and just loved it. It's uh, It was fun. And um, we were small. We only had a handful of people. And I was able to kind of introduce new processes and procedures and systems and really enjoyed the sales side. And it just kind of took off from there. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, you think back when, you know, these guys, they don't have, you know, don't have any, any processes, you know, they don't have any computer to put that into, you know, it's kind of all manual and I'm astounded how they could keep that all in their head. Absolutely astounded. I mean, I, I'm just like, I, I don't get it. How could you keep track of all these sales, these customers, you know, all of this, you know, just uh, really in a very manual fashion? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you know, in back in those days, we didn't have, you know, speed dial and all these things. And 
I don't know, there were hundreds of phone numbers I knew. And you'd walk up to the old thermal fax machine and you just knew the fax numbers and you just figure it out. You're forced to back then. Now you're just clicking mm -hmm. on things. But when you don't have a choice, it's amazing what can happen. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, again, you're sitting in school and you're like, okay, I can do all this stuff. And then what's going on over here at, uh, what's dad up to over here? And I, I think it can be frustrating, you know, for, for kids, especially, I mean, not even second generation arts, but people coming out of school, coming into these businesses and they look at, well, I've been doing this while I'm in school. I've been on these systems or using this technology. And then you go to that first job and you're like, man, you guys are a little behind the times here. It can be frustrating. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I get my hands involved in things to this day that I probably shouldn't be messing with, but we have three locations and I pulled most of the uh, Ethernet cable and all of them and terminated the connections and all because we were a small business. We couldn't yeah. afford to bring the IT yeah. guys in and cable the company. So I'd be there nights and weekends pulling uh, cable and, you know, <laughs> crawling under desks, doing all that stuff. Yeah, man. I tell people, you know, I actually had hair, you know, before I got into IT, you know, <laughs> for my company, you know, and doing all this stuff, you know, dragging under, under desks and uh, no, I won't fix your computer. Okay. Please don't put that screensaver on there again. Those kinds of things. Oh yeah. No one ever touches anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So, you know, you got into the family business. So, you know, once you made that decision, you know, and you took the job for, Maybe less than the pay you, know, you were looking for, but at least you got in. What was kind of the big, uh, where, where did you really want to make your first impact in the organization? Well, I came on board and, um, you know, I was really thrown into outside sales initially. And, you know, my father handed me a stack of business cards with his name on them and mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm scratching his name and putting my name over it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I, it, it, it was it was crude, but I was out on the road and I didn't know what I was selling. Yeah. I had a line sheet uh, and I'd put it on someone's desk and read it to them upside down, basically, and trying to fake it. And yeah, uh, most people saw it through me, but there were enough kind people out there who kind of uh, helped me along and some that took me under their wing. And um, I learned a lot. And we, we had some good people inside too who helped sure. me along. But sure. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of training. It was really just, hey, here's some business cards, uh, go sell something. Before I forget, could you just tell the audience what Energy Pipe does, what your market is, what you go after? Well, we started as a stainless house 36 years ago now, mm -hmm. and we were stainless only. That was pretty much our thing. Stainless uh, pipe. Yeah. Stainless pipe, pipe. Yeah. valves, fittings. Yep. And I told people forever, yeah, no, no, we, we don't deal with that rusty stuff. You know, <laughs> it, it didn't want anything to do with carbon. Nothing dirty. No, nah, no, nah, we're, we're going to be the clean people here. Yeah, but times change and the company's sure. evolved and, um, you know, now we do carbon, we do uh, plastics, we do copper. You go where the market brings you, you see opportunity, you mm -hmm. follow it. And um, we've traditionally done a ton of business in the marine sector. Yeah, yeah. Industrial and, you know, fabrication as well. Mm -hmm. But a couple of years back, we opened up in uh, Birmingham and mm -hmm. they don't build boats in Birmingham. No, they do not. No. So up there, we've gotten a lot more into the mechanical market and a lot more mm -hmm. plumbing items. And uh, we've learned things up that way that uh, made relationships up that way that we're dragging that knowledge down south and selling it along the Gulf Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of same customer sales, but we're selling them products we never dreamed of. Gotcha. You know, one thing that you mentioned, you know, when you went out on the road, and, you know, again, scratching your name, you know, your dad's name out and, and putting your name on there. But you, you mentioned the people, you know, some of these customers that took you under their wing. And I think that's a really great point that I think there's an intimidation factor sometimes with newer salespeople, you know, that they go up to these folks and if they can go in humble, and, and I suspect that's kind of the approach you made, that there's a lot of really great people that will, you know, show you the ropes and it doesn't have to be as intimidating as, as people make it. It doesn't have to be. There were some older guys who, um, you know, I guess they kind of looked at me almost like I was like a grandson. Yeah, exactly. We'd have lunch and they'd talk and, and really tell stories and I, I could learn a ton from them. There were others who, they weren't nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. You know, it was, uh, it would be a bad experience knocking some of those doors and, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> I'd walk away and think one day, I'll be back one day. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be back. You won't be here anymore, but I'll be back. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think, you know, and that's an important thing to kind of share with some of your newer uh, salespeople, you know, your younger salespeople that, that, hey, there are going to be some really good people, you know, and as long as you're humble and you're willing to listen, that they're going to teach you a lot of good things and they're going to reward you with business that you really probably didn't deserve or didn't earn. But if you're humble, they kind of like you, you know, they're almost taking pity on you. Like, all right, kid, I'm going to, I'm going to help you out. No doubt. I remember being brought in and sit me down and look at the quote and say, Hey, let me show you something. Yeah. <laughs> and just look at the quote and show me here's where your problem is. You're, you're good here. You're high here. You got to fix this, that, or the other. And they gave me a chance. And yeah, um, yeah I still look back at some of these guys and uh, I wouldn't be where I am without them. The other thing is a lot of them are not win-lose people. You know, there's a lot of people that want you to be successful as well. As long as everybody's kind of on an even keel and, uh, you know, they're doing right by their organization, you know, they're going to walk you through some of this stuff and and show you a little something so they don't have to deal with it later. You know, I, I would go out and just try to be pleasant and have a positive attitude. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you ask questions. We all start from somewhere and... uh I don't know anybody who comes into the PVF world and knows everything. Sure. So um, it's not like they have the tutorial at school, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, there's not the the plumbing, you know, pipe valve and fitting tutorial. Uh, hey, here's how you do all this stuff. I mean, now we're getting a little more sophisticated with some video work and things like that. But probably, you know, at the time you jumped in the mix, I mean, you might dig through some catalogs and, and get lucky every once in a while, and and maybe have an opportunity to ride with you know, maybe some of your suppliers and glean some information out of that. Well, you know, it's 30 plus years and I'm still learning. Yeah. We get introduced to new brands, new product lines, and every day I'm trying to figure out uh, some of these new lines. It's plumbing and I'm, I'm new to that world, but that's what makes it exciting. Sure. It makes it interesting. I mean, you know, distribution does not have to be a dull uh, trudge through this, you know, through the career. It's, you can get into all kinds of parallel or complementary items, you know, in product categories. And hey, your suppliers love to see somebody who's interested in complementary items and trying something different. It's fun. It's really yeah. is fun to get out there with uh, a new line, new suppliers. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I say, you, you, it can get stale if you're just doing the same thing every day. Sure, sure. So I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about, you know, business succession. You know, you and I met Really, the first phone call you gave, you know, you and I had talked about was succession really between uh, you and your father. You know, we had talked about some of the mechanisms, you know, how you all would work your transition plan between the two of you. But I think one of the things that, you know, we miss on is business succession for other roles in our organization, you know, because, you know, frankly, people age out, you know, they start to get to a point they want to retire and if we don't have a good backup plan, we can get ourselves in a little bit of trouble. And we're definitely in that spot today. Yeah. We've got a, a real strong group of, I'm going to say 50 somethings. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have a whole lot in the middle between, you know, the 35 to 50 range, uh, the cupboard's bare. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I guess I can look back and look at different people we've had through here and point the finger in the mirror. Right. It's not just me. We've had others here too. And we've failed to, I guess, really uh, look down the road in some ways. But, you know, it's not too late. No, it's not too late for sure. We've got some good people we've brought on board in the last uh, two to three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're younger. And, uh, you know, that millennial generation has gotten a bad rap in some ways yeah. because we've got some really talented uh, younger folks who have mm -hmm. uh, joined the team and they're full of energy. They're dedicated to what they do. And it's really been a pleasure to try to uh, bring them along. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's hard. I mean, you know, kind of bridging that gap, as you said, you've got this pretty good sized gap. You got this group of 20 somethings that, you know, want to make their mark. They want to figure out, you know, how do I get into maybe a leadership position in this organization, a departmental leadership, or it, I'm sure if you want to kick you out of your seat and, you know, and take over your spot, but you know, how do we kind of bring them into a position where they can take over these departments? I mean, one of the things you shared with me a while back was that you had a fairly flat organization. Could you expand a little bit about, you know, that philosophy? Well, 
you know, we were small and I had to open door policy. I tell people, you can call my cell phone 24 seven. You got something to say, let's hear it. Uh, mm-hmm. Text me, whatever. And it worked great for a while. Mm-hmm. It really did. And I meant it. Call me anytime. My door's mm-hmm. open and mm-hmm. people came in. But you grow and you're adding people. We'd have some managers. But a lot of times I've found that with my door, the open door policy and the flat structure, the fairly flat structure, yeah. even if I had a manager, mostly everything rolled to me. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you wind up with people who don't necessarily want to have the the tough talk, the difficult discussion. So uh, it all rolled to me. You yeah. Know? So we we had titles on people, but they didn't always grab the reins and run with it. It all kind of would fall back to me. And I believe that hampered our growth for a good while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, everything's coming into me and I'm trying to, I try to juggle a lot of balls. I'm handling a lot yeah, of different yeah. issues. And sometimes those things were distracting and they shouldn't have made it to me. Yeah. I mean, again, when you and I met, you know, early on, I mean, you were exhausted. I mean, you were, you were truly exhausted, you know, having to juggle all of these things and make everybody's decision at that point. You know, that was a really difficult period for you. Yes. My call to you is, uh, you know, a cry for help. Yeah. And we have come a long way since, uh, since meeting you. And we still don't have a heavy, uh, organizational structure. Yeah. We, we've got, we've got a few layers, but it's, it's made it easy for everyone now to, um, they know where to report. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, part of it was me. I had to know, go talk to your manager. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, what does your manager said? And push people out of my office, follow the proper channels. And we've had some managers who have been great with it. They really handle things well. Sometimes you get the manager who, you know, needs some guidance. Mm-hmm. Sure. But that's learning and training. You know, some of them have been really happy to take on the added responsibility. Mm-hmm. It's been good for us and it's really helped us grow because shifting some of that management and shifting some of that decision-making out of my office has allowed me to concentrate on uh, new avenues. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't think, you know, Birmingham really would have been there if you hadn't done some of that shifting out, you know, it started to push, you know, uh, responsibility back into its appropriate place. Oh, absolutely. Going from one location to two was a challenge. Yes. There was no way we could have done the third if we were still working the old way. Right. You know, and I received a, a piece of management advice several years ago that I, I just, it can two by four to the back of the head. It was like, you know, when somebody comes to your office and they ask you the same damn question over and over again, you know, it's it, it maybe couched a little differently, but it's the same question. And you got to look them square in the eye and say, Hey, how would you handle this? You know, it, it's like one of the greatest deterrents, you know, and you're putting the responsibility back in the right place. And so, you know, really, you know, with those managers, you know, that you got a little coaching to do, I I suspect that a lot of them are still answering the question from their uh, associates and sharing with them a brilliant piece of, you know, uh, management advice is, what do you think we should do? You know, or how do you think we should handle it? And then, and push the responsibility back on that associate to start thinking again. And I think that is one of the best things I was ever given, you know, over the years, that, that little piece of advice. And then I think it, it kind of works the same way with you when managers come to you and want you to solve their problems for them. Yes, absolutely. I sat in a, a meeting this morning with our managers and there were issues coming up and it was a conference yeah. call at all three locations and there was discussions and different issues and things that they had handled. And I sat there thinking to myself, I don't know anything about any of this, <laughs> but it's all been taken care of. Right, right. I didn't have to get involved. Yep. And there was happy resolution and, you know, we didn't lose anybody and the team's moving along. Yeah. And I, I just walk away thinking, okay, success. Yeah. Yeah. This is working. Well, there's a sense of freedom to it. You know, there's all of a sudden you kind of step back and go, hey, I actually have time to work on the business. I get to be the visionary. I get to use my creative juices and not get mired down in a lot of these operational challenges. Yeah. I'd run into a, a friend years ago, a couple of years, three years back, and he did very, very well. 
And I was asking a few questions about his business and how we did it, did things. And he told me, he says, the number one thing he learned was uh, someone had told him, you need to hire your replacement. Mm -hmm. He says, yeah. that's when he got free to grow the business. And, um, you know, we made a real good hire about three years ago. And um, I've got a true manager now who oversees the, uh, well, the operations. Absolutely. He's not so much on the sales side, but it's freed me up. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's made all the difference for us that I can focus on. Let's grow this thing. Yeah. You know, where can we go? Who can we be? Oh yeah. I, I mean, heck of a hire. I mean, I, you know, I spent some time with him and, uh, you know, fantastic individual and really taking a lot of the minutia off your shoulders. I think that is the big thing that now you, again, by freeing yourself up and really, you know, to the point that, you know, your friend had made about, hiring your successor. I mean, you kind of think about that. It's like, Hey, look, there's some things that I really shouldn't get involved with anymore. And I think this is one of the big mistakes I've run into, especially in a smaller entity that the uh, owner operator feels like they need to have their fingers in every pie. And it absolutely, you know, slows them down and limits that growth and limits that ability to think, how do I change this entity? And circling back to our discussion here is about how do I start either training or recruiting those people who are going to take over critical uh, pieces of the business so I don't have to deal with it? Yes. And, and we're doing a lot of that now. Training is a big thing for us. Yeah. We've got this great group of younger folks yeah. uh, who've joined us and they're smart. They're very capable. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what can we do to advance them? And you know, when I came on board, all the learning, the training was, it was organic. Yeah. You know, you just kind of, you absorb it. It was osmosis. It kind of on the fly, you're sitting there, you learn things when you're on the road or you pick up a sales call and you ask a few questions. There weren't all the training tools and techniques out there, mm -hmm. but now we've got our young crew. We're, we're out taking field trips. Yeah. We're taking people off the desk and they go outside and make some outside calls and uh, sit for a lunch with an outside guy. We have manufacturers coming into the office. We are sending people to different training sessions at the manufacturer's sites. Yeah. We're doing in-house training. I love to grab new people and go walk the warehouse and just, you know, play a little show and tell. Mm -hmm. and, and not even just for salespeople, you know, it might be somebody working. Uh, we got a new gentleman working with us on uh, data analytics. Okay. Well, teaching him product. Yeah. You know, clerical people, we're out there walking. Hey, here's a well neck flange. Let me right. show you this. It just helps. It helps everybody. And mm -hmm. some of that goes back, I guess, when I was first out in the road. You know, one of my crutches when I was first out outside sales was walk in with a product in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, when you walk in with a ball valve and you hand it to somebody, you got something to talk about. Absolutely. You know, or the, the new buyer would call in at a location. They don't know anything. And I walk in with a box of fittings and sit down and show them the difference between a socket weld fitting and a threaded fitting and, mm -hmm. you know, a, a 90 versus a T, you know, some things we take for granted, but you're that new buyer. They're buying skew numbers. It helps if you can give them an idea what they're actually doing. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And I think actually from your standpoint, it's kind of fun to do that, you know, because it's fun to see somebody's eyes kind of light up and they're like, oh, okay, that's what that part number is that has, has appeared on this PO over and over again. This is what it is. And there's a new sense of not responsibility, but more, you know, I guess, understanding and, you know, interest when, uh, you know, they know what that thing is and they know how critical it is or how it goes together with it, something else. Even if you are not in the operational side or selling, you know, from a procurement standpoint, or again, clerical, when you see these numbers, it just gives you a, a new depth of understanding of that organization. Yes. Especially with clerical people. Yeah. Because a lot of yeah. times they're just in a fog. Right. But you can you could show them a little product and let them spend a little time in the warehouse. Yeah, it changes everything. Well, it breaks them away from that. You know, it breaks them away from what they're doing on a regular basis. And you know, looking at you know reporting and what the ERP is telling them and things like that. It's a nice diversion. It's a nice break. You know, it, I'm really a believer in you know some of those diversions to get their creative juices going again. You know, because if we, if we're monotonous, if we continue doing the same old thing, 
then that's when mistakes start to happen or complacency starts to creep in. But if you can divert them a little bit, I think you can get them back in the game again. Yes. And when you go outside and you show them some product, all of a sudden you'll see the light bulb go off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now things that they've been doing for months seem to suddenly make sense. And they will take that little bit of knowledge and run with it. They will grab hold of customer calls with an issue or we had a, you know, something wrong with receiving a shipment. Well, they have confidence now I'm calling the the manufacturer and explaining the issue and Mm -hmm. working towards resolution. You don't have to get the, uh, maybe a salesperson involved. You know, before we jump to another subject, I just uh, wanted to address, you had uh, someone, a long, long long-term employee, somebody that you kind of grew up with in the business, you'll recently leave and that left a hole. I mean, there's a hole there, you know, again, looking at this business succession idea that maybe we weren't prepared enough for. That that was like, oh, you know, maybe we should have been ready that this person might want to, you know, wind down their career with you all. And, you know, how do you handle that? I mean, so again, looking at all of your roles, you know, how do you get ready for the the long term employee that might depart either, you know, by hit by a bus or, you know, or actually voluntarily? I mean, how do you do that? Well, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we lost a 29 year employee. Yeah. And he and I, uh, as a manufacturer, said, man, you guys are joined at the hip. Right. And we were. Right. But times change, people change, and, sure. you know, things evolve. So, yes, I guess it was a failure on multiple fronts for us not to uh, be better prepared. Yeah. But, you know, here we are, new year, and my charge for our 50 somethings. It's up to us to prepare the next generation. Right, right. And I look at it and I'm presenting it to them as in football, you got these coaching trees, whether it was Bill Parcell or sure. Belichick or Saban, and they got the coaches who all trained under them. And where are they today? Right. And that's kind of my challenge to our 50 somethings to myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Where's your coaching tree? Who have you trained up? Yeah. Who have you educated, who mentored, and if you're 50 something, you're 60 years old, you've been, this is all you've done all your life. I would think you ought to be able to look back and see some people that you uh, brought along. Yeah. And it, it, it's a challenge. For sure. And I think even if they don't work with you con- currently, I think there's still a sense of pride that, you know, maybe they went out and started their own business or maybe they left your organization and moved on to the repping business. You know, they got into the rep side or the manufacturer side. And yeah, I I think that's a great way to put it, Rob, is that you're looking back at these folks, what kind of a legacy did I leave? You know, who did I, you know, whose career did I enhance? You know, I think that's an important piece of management is training up someone, whether they stay or go, doesn't matter. No, agreed. And we spoke earlier about people who helped me when I was first out. Yeah, yeah. And like, I haven't forgotten them. And that, that's the challenge. That's the challenge I'm putting forth to our older guys. Yeah. We had year-end meetings with all of our people. And uh, yeah, I was reminded repeatedly in those meetings, I got a lot more years behind me than I'd have ahead of me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know the feeling, my man. Trust me. Yeah. And I didn't take it the wrong way. It is yeah. what it is. You know, when someone retires, hey, I'm saying congratulations, you got there. You yeah. Know? And yeah. Uh, I hope to be there one day myself. Still enjoying what I'm doing today, but um, we have to look ahead and I have to be looking at five, 10, 15 years. Yeah. And, you know, with our younger group, part of what we did year end was we showed them, hey, we got a group of guys who are all going to be rolling out of here over the next 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be a big void. And you guys, you're not going to be sitting behind a guy who's uh, 40 or 45. Mm-hmm. The future's yours. Right. And it's closer than... Uh, you know, we want to think, but yeah, let's get rolling with this and let's work on training you up and giving you the tools you need. Yeah. I mean, the older we get, the faster these years uh, pile on. I mean, it's all of a sudden, you know, you know, 2023 was a blur. I mean, that was just, you know, we blew through that. And so kind of reminding these young, younger people that are a little, that are hungry, Hey, trust me, it's going to get faster. You know, the years are going to get faster and you are going to be in your start in the starting position here pretty soon. Yeah. So just let's get you ready for that. Yes. And you know, the experience, the knowledge of 30 plus years in this, uh, in yeah. this business, you know, 
there's no reason to take that with me. Right. Or for other guys, you know. Yeah. So um, I really believe you've been a manager, a leader, and you you don't have that legacy and you haven't developed anybody. Yeah, it's a failure. Yeah. We can look at KPIs, sales, and look at numbers, but I think we'd all need to probably judge ourselves uh, beyond just numbers. Yeah. Now, I mean, you're not a self-appointed leader. If you don't have any followers and you haven't brought anybody up, not much of a leader, in my opinion. Agreed. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to touch on something, uh, you know, before I let you go here. A couple of years ago, you joined uh, uh, affiliated distributors. You know, you had joined a group and uh, you were mentioning to me that uh, it's really been a catalyst for your business. I mean, over the last couple of years. Could you share that experience a little bit? Yes. Joining AD was a, uh, a real game changer for us. You know, we were growing. Mm -hmm. Times are good. Business is good. We're making money. And um, we joined AD initially thinking uh, primarily about the rebates. Yep. Strolled into our first meeting thinking, you know, look at us, look how we're performing. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're up 20%. Oh, great. And then you go there and you're around these other independent distributors. Yeah. And I was quickly humbled. Really, really smart people, successful people. Our growth was... <laughs> marginal compared to what others are doing. And um, you sit around, you meet people, you talk, you learn so much. You make friends and mm -hmm. people that you can pick the phone up and talk through a situation and save yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah. So everybody's there to help you and to assist. And uh, it's been wonderful for us. We're, uh, I guess, going into our third year. Yeah. You know, hey, the rebates are great. Yep. Absolutely. But growing the business is, comes from the networking and the education you get by sitting. It, it could be in a formal setting or it could be uh, over a beer. Yeah, for sure. You, you learn what others are doing and how they're doing things and how we're all fighting the same fights. You know, and, uh, you know, I encourage people to, to find these organizations, you know, and a lot like your story. I mean, you guys were independent, you know, for a long time. And you're kind of subject to your own best ideas, you know, at that point. And, uh, you know, when you get this opportunity to sit down with other like companies, you know, around the country, and here's the great part is a lot of them are willing to share things that you were like, well, well, I never knew I could share stuff like that. You know, and you weren't taught that way. I mean, you know, maybe your first generation, you know, with your dad, we were taught to kind of keep everything tight, you know, not share too much. But boy, you walk into a setting like this, you know, with an organization and they're ready to go. You know, they're going to help you any way they can. And I think that's refreshing. Yes, because here we were with the same leadership for 30 years. Yeah. We didn't have any new blood. We hadn't worked anywhere else. All we knew was our company, what we knew. And, um, you know, I read. I've read some of the same old books, but mm -hmm. it's different when you're sitting around talking to somebody and yeah. yes, we would develop new plans and new uh, compensation strategies and you try it out and it fails and then you mm -hmm. redesign, you try it out and it fails. So it's nice with AD and the networks and the people we've met because you can talk and they'll say, oh, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't do that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we went that direction. That's not going to work for you. Yeah. Here's what has worked. And yeah. um, we'll come home from meetings and get on uh, Zoom calls. And people are sharing their spreadsheets. And here's how the formula works. And, oh, it's, it's, it's huge. It made all the difference to us. Mm -hmm. And um, people there inspire you and humble you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing and how good you think you are. Mm -hmm. There are those who are just running circles around you. Yeah. Yeah. They're better. But again, the, the whole point is they're willing to share so that you can accelerate your business. And I think that's a really important, and I think it's also going into those types of meetings a little bit humble, you know, looking in and say, Hey, you know, maybe I, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. And Hey, I'd love to get some advice on how you all did this. Yes. You know, I, um, I love sitting around and hear different people's stories and the challenges they have, because it's not just a take situation. We're there sharing, hey, our successes and yeah. our failures, and we're hoping that we're giving back as well. For sure. For sure. Now, I, I, again, I encourage this, you know, with all distributors, and I know my 
association friends might not love me for that. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, really being part of these groups, this is a, a 10x. I mean, it really will accelerate your business. And so I'm really glad that you all got in and you're getting in full, you know, you're going in with both feet and you're know, really involving yourself with the organization and not just looking at it as a, a rebate generator. Because I think there that is a mistake. Oh, yes. It's so much more than that. The value is beyond the rebates. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, hey, Rob, it's absolutely been a pleasure catching up with you, man. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking about some of this stuff and looking at your company and, and where you've come from when I met you. And, and it's just, it's fantastic. You know, I, I love seeing that your, your door isn't as open as it used to be. So now you've got that visionary time. So nothing but success, man. Jason, thanks. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, talking and learning from you and, you know, hopefully we can run into each other soon. Uh, looking forward to it. You take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, consider sharing with your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast application. Links to sponsors, products, and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area or at www distributiontalk.com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by the brilliant team at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com dot com.